Welcome back. In the last video, I showed how an FCPS is commonly connected to a fire alarm panel. Um, in this video, I want to kind of go over that just briefly again, um, and then explain kind of explain a couple other features of it. There's several ways that you can connect an FCPS to fire alarm panels, particularly if they're addressable fire alarm panels. And there's several features of the FCPSs which can be kind of confusing. If you look at the manual, there's so many different there's so many different things you can do that it can be a little bit overwhelming. So over the next couple of videos I'd like to try to make some sense of all that. So quickly this is just um, this is a this is a drawing of a addressable fire alarm panel. It's using its knack to trip the FCPS. So in a normal state the red wire here, this positive terminal, um, if you metered these two terminals they, they would actually have negative voltage on them. And then when it goes into alarm the voltage increases and switches polarity. Um, and when that happens that turns on this this FCPS. When this input voltage changes polarity and, and you get you know negative and positive on the on terminals three and four down here, um, that's when it triggers its outputs. Now it's going to trigger the outputs differently depending on all the dip switch settings which we saw in the last video um, and I think in this video I'll explain some of that. But um, as you can see up here I've got some horn strobes connected to each output except for output number four output number four is bypassed. Um, so I, I kind of explained how these circuits are all supervised and that any trouble on the FCPS is going to show up as an open circuit on NAC1 on the fire alarm panel. So if I were to, let's see, if I were to, my computer's running really slow right now. If I were to open up a circuit, I'm at the, to, uh, the upper right this top horn strobe and I'm just kind of erasing that positive line this is going to go into trouble and on that other screen which we saw up I could scroll up this this neck trouble light up here would come on but the way your fire panel would look would be a trouble on this neck because I, I mentioned before that there are internal there's internal trouble contacts from output one here to the positive. So po positive in, positive out is is closed until the FCPS goes into trouble. Then that opens this panel. The current can no longer flow through the inline resistor, which is going to put that panel in trouble. Now there are other features of the FCPS which I want to discuss a little bit. I want to start to get into some of the dip switches. Um, real quickly, the last dip switch, dip switch 8, that one's probably the most simple to understand. If you turn dip switch 8 on, then output 4 is no longer a knack. It's configured for a door holder, which means in a normal state when the panel's clear, you're going to have a constant 24 volts coming off of those terminals. Um, and when the panel goes into alarm, it's going to drop out. And the idea is that you just wire that up to a door holder, then you don't need any more external relays. It's just going to lose voltage on alarm, and it's just a, it's just a um, it's just a nice option that you know you sometimes see used. You don't you don't often see it used. Another thing you'll see sometimes is if um, think about how this thing's tripped by using just 24 volts to input one. Again, depending on dip switch settings, but um, one feature of these panels is that the auxiliary terminals right here those have a constant 24 volts DC present at them. Um, it can be resettable or non-resettable based on dip switch settings, which again we'll go into. Um, but sometimes what you'll see is these are just jumpered directly. So imagine that the panel's not hooked up right now. You could just jumper your aux, your aux power here to your input, and now all of these are going to all these outputs are going to come on depending on your dip switch settings. But if all the dip switches were basically off, you'd just be taking 24 volts wiring it up so that these are constantly on and then you'd have 24 volts power available to do whatever you wanted with it. Um, the only thing to keep in mind if you do that is, um, you know, usually you'd use that for maybe resettable power for smoke detectors um, or maybe power to door holders or something like that. Um, 
The only thing to keep in mind is whatever your FCPS is rated for, you actually get two amps less current than that because that th those those current ratings are not for continuous use. Whereas if this were constantly powered on, this would be for can this would be you know be used continuously. So if you were using the F the S6 model, you'd only have four amps of current available. If you're using the S8, you'd have six amps of current available. Um, the notifier panels when the when the and, and the firelight when they're an alarm they still charge their batteries but I've seen other manufacturers like the Edwards um, power supply which is the BPS uh, I, I found that when they when you when you configure those FCPS's in that well those BPS's in that manner they do not charge the batteries um, and the idea behind that is if your horns are going off they want to they want to dedicate as much power to the horns as possible so during that period of time they're not charging the batteries um, which makes sense if you're using it for for horn circuits, but if you're using it for door holders and that's constantly on and you have ba you have batteries hooked up, well, you're you're not going to charge your batteries. And I, I learned that the hard way after uh, replacing batteries a couple times and you know going back and realizing, hey, maybe there's something else going on here. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of a side note. Um, one feature that I want to talk about is synchronization of horns or horn strobes, I should say. Um, it's something we have not talked about yet. The Americans with Disabilities Act um, requires that if there are strobes going off, that they be synchronized. If you can see any strobe, any any two or more strobes that you can see from one place have to flash together. And the reason is people with epilepsy, if you have picture a room full of strobes that are all flashing out of sync at different times, it can cause people with epilepsy to have a seizure. So they all have to flash. I think it's the code tells you. I think it's like twice per second, or not more than whatever it is. Um, and so there are these pulses that are programmed into some of these devices. And there's three main sync codes, and they go by manufacturer. So there's Wheel Lock, System Sensor, and Gentex. Um, if you're using Wheel Lock sync code, you have to use all Wheel Lock devices. You can't have even one. Um, system sensor or um, Gentex device on that circuit that you're trying to sync. Um, and they also have to be compatible strobes. You know, before a certain date, the, even the wheel lock strobes weren't sync strobes, but anything that you buy today will be. Um, and when you're doing this, that's where that, that sync terminal at the, at the bottom here, let me try to get rid of some of this. All right. So the sync terminal at the bottom here, that's where that comes into play. There's two main, the FCPS can be configured as a master if you are going to be syncing strobes, or it can be a slave. And what would determine that is how you're triggering it. If your fire alarm panel had that capability, most new addressable fire alarm panels have the synchronization capability built into them. So I would go into programming and tell this panel NAC1 is, let's say, a system sensor sync. That's the type code of that NAC. Well, now that's going to have that sync code on there. And if I do that, then I can ignore this sync input here. Well, no, that's not true. If, I, if, if this is my master, then I would need to take these wires and jumper them to the sync input. So I would, I would still come into terminal 1 just like this, and my, my resistor would still be where it is. But then I'd make a little jumper that goes from here I thought I was on red there, but you get the idea. And then gray, I'd go four to two, another little jumper here. Um, and all I'm doing is now that's the that's the sync input, so that's the pulse that it's going to get. And now all of these are going to follow that sync that's being triggered from the fire alarm panel. Um, if if it's uh, if if I'm not doing if I, if I'm ignoring the sync code or there is no sync code coming in on my trigger then I would set the dip switches to make the FCPS a master and you can do that either as um, you know then you pick which which manufacturer so I'm gonna pull up the the FCPS um, dip switch settings quickly and if you look at the first three dip switch one two and three first of all look at number three if, if, if dip switch three is set to on then the FCPS is configured for slave synchronization. So that means it's going to follow your fire alarm panel or whatever your trigger is. Um, if it's 
If that dip switch is off, then the FCPS is set as the master and it's going to create its own. So if you look at switches one and two, those tell the outputs how they're going to um, behave. If both of them are off, then there is no sync. If one is off, two is on, it's system sensor and so on, you can you can read the rest. There's no reason for me to for me to read that. Um, but looking at my time, this is generally where I like to stop the videos. Um, I'm probably going to pick this one up, pick the next one up where I left this one off because I want to get into some of this a little bit more. And I also want to get into tripping the FCPS with a control module because that's fairly common as well. So I will see you in the next video.